one expected the eruption of Hecla that began after 22 years silence on the evening of the 5th of May 1970. Nor did anyone expect an eruption at the foot of the mountain to the southwest instead of on the main ridge. Almost simultaneously another began to the west and about an hour later fires burst out at Skjolkvir, an area northeast of the ridge. On the first evening the eruption from the southwestern fissure was by far the most powerful. The eruption cloud reached a height of 50,000 feet while glowing lava fountains rose more than 3,000 feet but these had dwindled considerably by the next morning when filming began. The eruption at Skjolkvir was similar. It began on the morning of the 6th of May from a fissure more than 500 yards long, running north and south, and with the biggest lava fountains from the southernmost end. morning there was still a sizable cloud of tephra over the southwestern craters but the tephra fall was virtually ended. On the first morning many people drove to see the western eruption while others went to Skolkvir. flow at Skjolkvir was over a mile long. It had typical block lava edges, for it was of intermediate composition. Some of the lumps ejected by these craters at the start of the eruption were of no mean size. The lava fountains died down a great deal in the first night of the eruption, but the southernmost one was still impressive from a close-up view the following morning. When the Tephra fall ended, the ridge of Hecla, which was completely white, had a black segment of ash extending all the way to the coast. By the evening of the 6th of May, the southwestern lava flow had extended as far as the Tripperfjöll. On the 8th, the lava edge south of these mountains was almost stationary, but it had reached a considerable height. Activity in the southwestern craters was nearly over on the third day of the eruption, and completely by the 10th of May.
The stationary lava now enclosed the eastern part of the Tripperfjert like pincers. On the 20th of May, the fires were quite extinguished at Skjöldkvjör, by which time the new Hekla lava covered an area of about 14 square kilometers. But on the same day, a little to the north, an eruption fissure over a thousand yards long opened to vomit lava without a pause until the end of the eruption on the 5th of July. This fissure cut diagonally across an old ridge of Tuva, forming in it a string of cinder cones. These cones were easily reached, and on the evening of the 21st of May, it was possible to enjoy a close-up view of them. Whirlwinds are common over flowing lava due to the great emission of heat. The craters emit red-hot lumps of lava continuously, though rather spasmodically, building up walls of cinders about them, while molten lava flows through gaps in these to the north. Many enjoyed the nightly show put on by these craters. Here we see shots of the first night performance of the 21st of May. It was a delight to the eyes, but also a very instructive demonstration of how cinder craters are formed. From time to time, explosions cause the lava to disintegrate into a dark pall of ash. The temperature of the lava was about 1050 degrees centigrade. From close up, the fragments of lava are clearly seen to be darker on the way down than on the way up, for they have cooled. The lava from these craters is dreadfully rough and difficult to cross. In many places, gases rise from it, forming a greyish, white or yellow precipitation of various kinds. You could drive right up to the edge of the lava. The tracks taken by cars in the evening were often covered the next morning. Occasionally, a car had a narrow escape from being overwhelmed by the advancing lava.
Here we see a good example of the slow advance of an edge of block lava. Lumps roll over a creeping dough of molten lava from like a conveyor belt. In the lava near the craters, there are plenty of strange stones of every kind from the bowels of Hecla. The world-famous volcanologist Harun Taziev and students of geology from the University of Iceland investigate these stones. Nearly all the tephra from this eruption appeared in the first few hours, and the valley of the river Thjorsau completely changed its colour. The light tephra from a major eruption that laid waste the valley in ancient times was covered by a dark layer. The power station settlement at Boerfett had its share of the tephra fall, for the wind blew straight from the craters when the eruption began, and the area was covered with a layer almost three inches thick. After the first night, the valley was like a desert. But it was amazing how growth managed to force a way up through the tephra. But some plants lost their natural colour, like one of the tufts of bent grass seen here, probably because of substances in the ash. No more than a thin sprinkling of ash was needed to kill the moss. In earlier ages, the Icelanders were only too often allies of the destructive powers of nature. But now they came to the aid of the forces of growth, spreading fertilizer and clearing ash from the vegetation wherever possible. To the beautiful valley of the Thjorsau, so often harshly treated by Hecla, they brought the hope of a renewed colour of life. <laughs> <laughs> 